Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Andy Rich. I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School of Civic and Global Leadership here at City College, and I, I want to welcome everybody to this very important discussion about the war in Ukraine. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine has sparked the greatest crisis between Russia and the West since the end of the Cold War, and it is creating one of the largest refugee crises that we've seen okay. in the globe, and particularly in Europe since World War II. So why did Russia do it? How should Europe respond? Where does the United States fit in? Does it end, spell the end of friendly relations between Russia and the West? These are big questions, and these are some of the questions we hope to look at today in a conversation that is going to be guided by three um, extraordinary panelists. Rajan Menon, Deanna Bernard Spitzer, Chair Emeritus at the City College of New York, Cynthia Roberts, a professor of political science at Hunter College, and Jack Snyder. Robert and Renee Belfort, Professor of International Relations at Columbia University. Here are just a few headlines from this morning's New York Times. Ukrainian force, forces stall Russian advance and civilian suffering. Tens of thousands of Ukrainians are without food, water, and power. The image of Russia's military as an unstoppable force has been shattered, which European adversaries have taken note. When we come together at a particular moment, an inflection point, don't know which inflection point it is necessarily in this conflict and one that is far from over. I want to turn it over to Bruce Cronin, who's a professor of political science who played a key role in helping to organize this event. Um, but before I do that, I want to say a special thanks to one of our panelists, Rajan Men. Because Rajan Men is the one that I just did it. And it Bernard's chair, um, chair emeritus at City College. He became a chair emeritus, which is to say he retired from City College by my count 39 days ago. And yet here he is. Uh, because when we called him and said, we really think it's important for us as a community to have a conversation and you are the leading expert from City College on these issues. He didn't say, I'm no longer at City College. He said, of course, anything I can do for the city, for city College and for the Powell School. And I just wanna say, we haven't yet had a chance to properly thank and congratulate Professor Menon on his retirement. And this is not that occasion, but I do wanna thank him for being one of the most generous colleagues anyone could ever ask for, and for being so kind to be here with us today and setting an example, frankly, for how to be a scholar, a gentleman, um, an extraordinary teacher, a mentor. Uh, and so thank you very much. Thank you. Now let me turn it over. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rajan's appearance here is the first of many um, so the term retirement you should look at is a kind of a broad conceptual uh, thing. Okay, so each of the panelists will speak seven to 10 minutes, which for academics, they hear the 10, not the seven. So we'll have the three um, uh, 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 presentations in, uh, coming in order. It'll be followed by questions and comments. Uh, we have about, uh, about 80 people online. So we're gonna take questions from people online. Um, those of you who are online, uh, just put your question in the chat and we'll alternate between audience and, um, and people online. Um, when you pose your question, if you want to pose it to a particular speaker, make sure you say who it is. Otherwise, I'll either ask one of them or uh, one or more of them uh, will give responses. So we're going to start out uh, with uh, Jack Snyder. Thank you, Bruce. So Raj Menon and I uh, took a trip to Ukraine back in 2015. This to remember the setting, this was the year after the, so the, the Russians <laughs> um, annexed uh, Crimea and uh, supported the breakaway militias in the Donbass. Um, Ukraine was, um, angry about that, but Ukraine at that time was uh, still facing many difficulties of its own, even apart from this Russian challenge. Uh, the oligarchs uh, were still riding high. Uh, the politicians were dependent on their oligarchic backers. What really struck me was that even the progressives, the NGO activists that were working for democracy, free speech, rule of law in Ukraine, 
back in 2015 when we were talking to lots of people uh, like that in places like Lviv, in Dnipro, and in Kiev. Uh, even the progressives were saying, well, we need our oligarchs to back us, to do things like uh, buy us TV time so that we can get our message out to the skeptical population. So um, one of the things that we did during the trip was we uh, held a conference on Ukraine as a buffer zone. And uh, this was in Kyiv. And um, we got the message to the Ukrainian participants uh, that they should not hold out hopes that NATO was going to save their bacon in uh, the struggle against Russian domination, um, and that uh, this was for two reasons. Uh, the first reason we tried to say politely but clearly uh, that you guys don't have your act together yet. You're not a reliable partner for an alliance. Uh, and the second reason we gave was that Ukraine just is not important enough to the survival of the NATO states to risk escalation to direct war with Russia uh, on your behalf. So um, nowadays that there, there's been a, a great deal of improvement in Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian nationalism uh, has advanced in part in reaction uh, to uh, the growing challenges from Russia and Ukrainian attitudes um, have risen to the occasion. Uh, but Ukraine has also improved because of its greater involvement with uh, the European Union, uh, which has reduced corruption, started to get their economy rolling. So in terms of a more reliable partner uh, for the West, there's much more positive to say about Ukraine uh, nowadays. Uh, but the second point is still true. Um, Ukraine uh, is not uh, important enough to the security of the West to risk direct war with uh, Russia. And uh, that's a, a hard fact that remains true. So um, I want to just say a little bit about what I think uh, triggered the Russian invasion and uh, what lessons uh, that um, provides for how we think about the risk of escalation. And I'm kind of reporting on uh, opinions on the National Security Studies Listserv, which has hundreds of people on it, many of the international relations professors in the, you know, the United States are on this. And um, the debate goes as follows. One line of argument associated with John Mearsheimer, who's very prominent, you probably have heard his views, is that um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is uh, NATO's fault because we threatened the vital security interests of Russia. And this was all completely predictable. And from a geopolitical hard-nosed self-interest view, uh, understandable that uh, Russia should punch back against this threat to the core of its necessary sphere of influence. Uh, I have to admit that I think this is uh, completely wrong. Uh, certainly true that Russia had no reason to be happy about uh, NATO near its doorstep. But even though uh, NATO uh, started some preliminary accession discussions with Ukraine in 2008 at the end of the George Bush administration, uh, 
There has been no real progress on that. It was not going to happen. Uh, and Putin's invasion has brought about exactly the thing that um, this line of argument says uh, he was trying to prevent. So I think this first line of argument is so problematic that in and of itself, I don't credit it for much. The second line of argument I credit for much more, which is that Putin is afraid of color revolutions. Um, and uh, he saw not so much because of NATO, but because of the consequences of Ukraine's greater involvement with the European Union, that Ukraine was turning west in its economy, in its social attitudes, in its political attitudes, and that this is what was intolerable uh, to Putin. Um, one might say that Putin uh, could have been uh, warranted in thinking, well, movement uh, of this kind towards the European Union, socially and economically, would lead to a NATO commitment. And then sooner or later, the horrible fear of both of those commitments would occur. Uh, so in tandem, maybe. Uh, the third line of argument tends to be one that uh, talks about Putin's obsession with greater imperial Russia, that Ukraine really is not a nation. It's actually part of imperial Russia, and he's been obsessing about this for at least a couple of decades. Um, this, uh, the problem that I have with this explanation is how does it fit with the fact that Putin is making enemies of the Ukrainians by attacking their civilian population. Uh, he's making the reality of like the one unified Slavic Russian nation uh, less possible than it was. Um, there's a fourth explanation that focuses on Putin's psychology, which I think is an important factor. Uh, so, what strategy is implied by this like, morass of possible motivations? Um, many people think that the goal is to conquer all of Ukraine and to rule it through repression, uh, corruption, and uh, threats that leave something to chance to deter NATO. Um, Another line of uh, conjecture is that the strategy is to create a never ending chaos in Ukraine uh, so that Ukraine can never be a model uh, to uh, stand as a possibility in the eyes of the Russian people. Um, the second goal is a possibility if Russia falls short and fails to achieve uh, the, the first goal. Um, so uh, what should uh, the West, Western-led coalition, uh, what, what approach uh, should they take in playing this game? Well, the worst outcome is clearly um, military escalation leading to direct conflict between NATO and Russia. Um, so to prevent that, we need to think of outcomes that would uh, create clear boundaries and clear escalatory thresholds uh, so that the parties would not stumble across them into uh, a war that uh, would escalate in a way that no one wants. Uh, so one uh, worst case way to have a degree of clarity would be if Russia conquered all of Ukraine and you reconstituted the Iron Curtain along its western boundary. A best case route to clarity uh, is that if the Russian military and economic situation continues to take a nosedive and Russia gets bogged down uh, and really is desperate to uh, 
settle the, this um, misguided endeavor. Um, the West, in conjunction with the Ukrainian government, can offer new UN supervised elections through, uh, throughout Ukraine um, following a Russian military withdrawal that would offer a plebiscite on sovereignty in Crimea and Donbass to like whatever majority votes for it, could offer an election for a new government for the rest of Ukraine, could offer armed neut neutrality status for Ukraine outside of NATO, but with no limits on uh, foreign support for the strengthening of Ukrainian armed forces, uh, and with uh, no membership in NATO, but membership in the European Union. Uh, that, I think, would be uh, a stable outcome if uh, Russia admits that its effort has been a complete failure. Um, so uh, that's, that's where I will pass the baton to my colleagues. Professor Roberts. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be at City College, uh, such a beautiful campus. Um, so I'm going to focus my seven to 10 minutes on uh, looking specifically at the use of force and um, other elements uh, of coercive diplomacy in the context of what we know uh, about these questions in social science and international relations. So let me start with the most successful and the least costly uh, and move up to um, the most costly and um, arguably what might be the least successful near where Jack left off. Uh, tragically uh, for Ukraine, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian crisis going back to 2014, and it, it goes earlier than that, but um, um, in, in, in the armed conflict dimension, 2014 is a good place to start. And here we have, uh, most importantly, the Russian um, fait accompli operation against Crimea, a relatively bloodless uh, campaign um, that um, fits in the norm of our expectations for fait accomplis. Uh, they have a high base rate of success in international relations. Land grabs are used more commonly, including island grabs, than most people realize. Um, and the expectation in a fait accompli is that you'll grab the piece of territory, obviously not something so big as all of Ukraine, but about the size maybe of Crimea, um, and that your opponent uh, won't uh, uh, try to recover it back, won't fight to, to take it back. Um, it's different from the use of Bruce force in in major war, and it's different from making a coercive threat, give it to me or else, uh, it's just a seizure. Um, and we know from uh, our colleagues uh, like um, Altman in, in, in international relations scholarship that um, usually it doesn't provoke a response, the, the Falklands being one of the exceptions to that rule. Uh, by comparison, the Russian intervention support of the so-called separatists in Eastern Ukraine, Donbass, was much less successful, um, and uh, the Kremlin learned, uh, perhaps to their surprise, that Russian speakers are not automatically willing to fight to rejoin Russia. Uh, in fact, most of them were quite happy living in Ukraine, uh, wanted better relations, good relations with both the West and with Russia, certainly not this devastating war, um, but not loyal to a Russian national idea just because they speak Russian. Uh, moving on to brinkmanship and coercive diplomacy, this has a less successful track record, um, and it also fits in the Ukrainian context. Moscow, of course, failed to successfully pressure Kiev to uh, implement the Minsk Accords um, because they would have been death to any politician, uh, political leader in Ukraine. Uh, similarly, the Kremlin failed in its um, excessive, unbelievable demands to NATO uh, at the end of last year to formally uh, and in writing uh, agree to exclude Ukraine ever from joining uh, NATO um, and to be neutral and to remove all of the capabilities from 
um, frontline uh, eastern flank NATO members that currently uh, are in NATO. Um, that failed. So all of these uh, pressure uh, campaigns, brinkmanship, coercive diplomacy were unsuccessful and uh, coercion is hard. But by the same token, we have to admit, and um, I wrote about this in an article that came out on Christmas Eve, that the US also failed uh, with its Western partners to deter Moscow from launching major war against a partner country, in this case, Ukraine, uh, by using what I call weaponized finance, uh, financial and other economic sanctions. Even the threat of extreme sanctions uh, did not succeed in deterring or coercing Moscow from launching uh, its behavior, um, its, its aggression. Maybe this was an information asymmetry. Perhaps the Russians didn't understand how bad it was going to get. Um, uh, I myself was a little surprised when the central bank was sanctioned. Now about half of uh, the Russian sovereign is uh, not accessible uh, to the Russians. Um, but still, they were pretty well prepared. They'd buffered. The hit was going to be strong, but uh, the Russians have, uh, but the Kremlin was prepared to go ahead anyway. So that also failed. It might be more useful as a lesson and a signal for China in the future, but we're not here to talk about China today. So then what about major war? Putin, obviously, uh, Russia crossed the Rubicon. They invaded in a major war uh, in Europe, uh, an extraordinary move that surprised, surprised virtually everyone. Um, and uh, here it looked initially like they were going to win quickly. Uh, there's an imbalance of power, the strong against the weak, a David and Goliath. Um, Ukraine had improved its military capabilities, but Russia had also improved theirs and was significantly stronger on paper. On the other hand, uh, the weak often win. I mean, I've been teaching international security courses for a long time, and we in the United States know that. Uh, we just lost our longest war in Afghanistan. The Russians, then the Soviet Union, also lost a major war in Afghanistan. Uh, and there are other cases like uh, Vietnam. So it's not guaranteed that, um, uh, especially in a long war, that the strong will win. A lot will depend on how this war uh, is fought, the will of the Ukrainians, whether they get support or not. It does seem clear that the Russians were overconfident, overoptimistic. Uh, we don't have uh, sufficient information to say for sure. I did have a conversation with a contact who happened to be in the Genstab, the general staff last week, and he said they were exuberant. And he was shocked. How could this be? Um, obviously, information is being heavily controlled uh, in Russia, but, but still, maybe they are going according to their plan. It doesn't look like that to us. So how will this war proceed? I think it, we're already seeing that. Um, wars that become difficult, major wars, especially by the Russians, but for others as well, often become quite brutal. And Russia has traditional methods of brutality. Um, uh, back in 2014, I didn't think the, that Putin would go further uh, because the circumstances in the modern world are different than they were, say, in the uh, 1940s in World War II, uh, in, in that war against Nazi Germany. Um, but even in, in the Soviet Union's earlier wars in, in the late 30s, brutality was the mode of operation. And this seems to be uh, the likely outcome. Uh, we saw some taste of that in Syria, and now we may sadly see it in Ukraine. Brutality sometimes succeeds. We have to recognize that. Um, insurgencies um, um, can improve the prospects of the weaker state. Um, it's hard to predict with certainty now what will happen. One thing we know for sure, it's going to be very costly. It already is very costly for Ukrainians. The Russians can also engage in a siege uh, as they were sieged in Leningrad in, against Nazi Germany. And it does appear that in capturing the nuclear power stations um, and controlling power, electricity, water, and so on, that that may be another option they might be willing to resort to. And then finally, I'll end with um, the nuclear risks. I do a lot of work on this question as well. Um, Putin has been engaging in nuclear saber rattling. This is not new, but is getting more uh, ratcheting up the level. This goes back to 2014 when he said that Russia was prepared. He said in a television interview after the annexation of Crimea that what was, Russia was prepared 
to put its nuclear weapons on a full alert uh, if it came to that, if there was a challenge to the Russian occupation of um, and annexation of Ukraine. Uh, now we see the alert status being ratcheted up, drills continuing. It's not, um, we're not one second from nuclear war, uh, but there are scenarios under which uh, the nuclear uh, crisis uh, could emerge. And I would not rule out the possibility now of nuclear use. Let me end on that sad note. <laughs> now we'll have the optimist, uh, <laughs> Professor Menon. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Or as you like to be called when you were department chair, fearless leader. <laughs> Andy, thank you for the kind words. This is the second time in two weeks that I've come before a former employer to talk on the same subject. But I don't look at City College as a former employer. Some of the friends of mine who are your friends said to the audience, so I feel I got coming, I'm coming back home. Uh, I have a new job now. I work for an outfit called Defense Priorities. I hadn't, oh, here we go. Yeah. How's this? Can you, hear, can you hear me now back there? Yeah. Um, it's called Defense Priorities. And one of the things that we do, which is both a blessing and a curse, is to deal with the press. And the first thing I'm asked by people in the press is, why is it that Vladimir Putin is willing to start the largest state-to-state -state war that Europe has seen in a generation? And I say that there are two reasons. One is a composite of geography and demography. And the other, for want of a better term, has to do with what I'll call emotion, and I'll explain it. Geography and demography. Ukraine is the largest country in, the, in Europe, save Russia, in land area. It's a big country. East to west, it's 880 miles at the longest point. In population, if you put aside Russia, it's about the sixth largest. So it is a very, very big country. It has a 2,700 mile coastline along the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. So the sheer size of it makes the trajectory of Ukraine, where will it be in the end, leaning westward or leaning eastward toward Russia of supreme importance to Mr. Putin, but not just to him. I think this is entirely wrong to see this as some Putin pathology, and I'm not gonna psychoanalyze Putin, but I think that just misses a lot of things. Uh, demography. So the population of Ukraine in the east, east of the Dnieper River, unfortunately, I don't have a map here, has been part of the Russian Empire for 330 years. That's the only part that's been part of the Russian Empire for that long. So if you hear Putin saying Ukraine has been eternally Russian, that is just wrong because all of Ukraine as we know it was attached to the Soviet Union in its present form only in 1945. The Western parts were in, let's see, the Lithuanian Pol uh, Polish Commonwealth, then Poland, and then the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Nevertheless, the percentage, the, the large proportion of Russian speaking Ukrainians, that is Ukrainians who say Russian is my first language, or ethnic Russians, adds another dimension. The emotional part. So when you hear President Putin speaking about Ukraine, he is a rather unemotional individual. You see his body language change and he sometimes loses his temper and he becomes overwrought. It's not a personality, it's not some psychological thing. I think for people like Mr. Putin, the idea that Ukraine, uh, which is part of a family of the Eastern Slavic group, modern day Russians, Belarusians, and Ukrainians that trace their lineage back to a ninth century entity called Kievan Rus that lasted from 882 AD to 1240. That is, that is where the Russians and the Ukrainians and Belarusians got their language. That, that's from where it evolved. That's where they got Orthodox Christianity. That's where they got a lot of their culture like monasticism, iconography, and so on. So Ukraine is important to Russia in a way that no other Soviet Republic is. With all due respect to IR theorists, when, they, when I hear them talk about this, I'm struck by their paucity of knowledge about Ukrainian history. Uh, but not Jack. Jack is Jack is different, and so is so is Cynthia. But um, I leave names un, unmentioned. So that's that's the that's the emotional part. Now let me talk about the war. At the start of the war, February twenty fourth, the Russians had about one hundred and twenty thousand troops, including National Guard troops. These are kind of police forces 
to uh, take charge of police cities along Ukraine's perimeter. A raid in the north from Belarus, from the east from Voronezh, from the southeast from Novocherkask, and from the south from Crimea. So they were in a position to wage a multi-azimuth combined armed war. Combined arms simply means you use air power, ground forces, cyber attacks, artillery. The Russian textbook is generally huge artillery barrages, a cyber attack, taking control of the airspace, and then pushing your ground troops forward. That is not what happened. It was a desultory affair, the breakdown in equipment, desertions of personnel, huge losses in armor, including also aircraft, partly because the Ukrainian army since 2014 has been trained and equipped by the United States, Canada, and the UK in ways I think that the Russians were not bargaining for. And I agree with Cynthia that they were expecting a much different kind of war. The tide is now turned, however. The pain has only begun. Because the Russian goal has never been, this is completely contrary to Russian military doctrine, it's never been to take a big city. So why haven't they taken Kharkiv in the Northeast, which used to be the capital of Ukraine, by the way, Russian Ukraine until 1934. Why haven't they taken Kiev, city of 3 million, the capital now? They don't have any intention of storming and taking a big city right off the bat because urban warfare is a bloody business. So what have they done? They focused on the southern coast. So Ukraine has a large coast, the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov, right? And the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov are the entree point, the exit point to the Mediterranean Sea. Very important. Russia's uh, Black Sea fleet is based in Sevastopol. So it makes it strategically important. What they aim to do in the South is to make Ukraine into a landlocked country. They wanna shut it off from the sea. That will be a crippling economic blow to Ukraine. As we speak, the bulk of the Ukrainian armed forces are between a place called Dnipro, kind of in the center, and Donbass on Russia's border. That army is about to be encircled. And the Russian strategy has always been a Clausewitzian strategy. You don't go after the enemy cities or little towns. You surround and destroy what Clausewitz called its main forces. Now, they were clumsy in doing this. And I think that the Russian army's much vaunted caliber has been uh, really sullied. Uh, I'll give you one example, logistics. Napoleon once said, an army marches on its stomach, by which he meant supplying an army is everything. They ran out of water, they ran out of blood supplies, they ran out of food supplies. You had Russian soldiers scouring for food in Ukrainian villages and actually people feeling sorry and taking them in. But having absorbed the pain of sanctions and the, and the, and the West essentially having shot all of its bullets, Putin now is not going to scale back the war. So any talk of a neutral Ukraine, a neutral arm Ukraine, this is all, we're done with that. Okay, the war is going to end in great brutality. They're scaling up direct attacks on civilian centers. And it is some combination of incompetence, errant missiles and airstrikes. But I've seen enough to know on footage that villages with absolutely no value are added. Let me quickly turn to the economics of this. The Russians are in a better position to wear the sanctions than they were in 2014. On the other hand, the sanctions are much bigger. So Cynthia mentioned the Russian central bank has basically its uh, dollar assets abroad have been impounded. Now, what does that mean? The ruble is in free fall. And if you don't have dollar assets, you can't buy rubles. The ruble tumbles, imports become more expensive. People become unhappy. There's a, there's a run on banks. There's a scramble to try to get rid of rubles and change them into dollars. Unfortunately, there are not enough uh, rubles. Seven Russian banks have been cut off from the SWIFT system. Think of the SWIFT system like a blood supply in the body. It is what moves money around. So if I buy something from Bruce and he's in country A and I'm in country B, right? He pays me and then from my bank, the money goes to him. I mean, he, he uh, exports what I need. I need to pay him. My bank sends it through the SWIFT system to his bank. So seven banks have been cut off. Not more because the Europeans wanted the energy sector exempted. Why? because 40% of Europe's energy consumption comes from Russia, and most people don't know this, 26% of its oil supply. So it is a huge thing. Now, the US has recently, along with the UK, stopped oil and gas supplies. It will be symbolic, it'll have zero effect. 
the percentage of Russian exports of crude oil that go to the UK is about 1.5%. The percentage of crude oil that goes to the US is about 1.3%. Not gonna make any difference. Now, let me say this and then I'll close. There is a belief that Russia will be crippled by sanctions and it will feel the pain for a long time. But bear in mind that it's not cost-free to us. The last time I checked the price of Brent crude and West Texas Intermediate, these are the two markers for oil prices, were above $1.20. We could see prices that go up to $1.50. In real terms, inflation adjusted terms, that would be much higher than the price of oil after the Iranian revolution in 1979. So expect higher oil prices, expect inflation to tick up because gasoline is used in so many different things, but that's not all. Uh, Ukraine and Russia together are responsible for 25% of all wheat exports and prices have gone through the roof. Ukraine is the sixth largest exporter of corn. Corn prices have gone through the roof. Container shipping, big companies like Maersk, Habak Lloyd, CGMA, CMA, they have stopped going and servicing Russian and Ukrainian ports. Why? It's too bloody dangerous and insurance rates have gone up. The cost of shipping petroleum on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the sea has quadrupled in the last uh, three weeks or so. Air freight, the Russians have banned 36 countries aircraft from their airspace. So they've had to reroute cargo, take lighter loads and freight rates have gone up substantially. How will this end? To be honest with you, I don't know because much of what's happened in this war, I would not have predicted. I, I will stand here and freely tell you that I've spent a lot of time studying this. And if you had asked me three weeks ago, would the Russians wage an all out assault on Ukraine in order to change the regime? I would have, I would have bet maybe $200, maybe $500, depending on how much I'd had to drink that day. Uh, there, there, there are two possibilities. One is, to remove the government of Kiev, led by um, Vlad Volodymyr Zelensky, who was a former comedian who's actually become a kind of Churchillian figure. It's ab absolutely remarkable. Unlike the president of Afghanistan who took off the first opportunity, he has stayed and he has become a kind of mythical figure. That enables him, by the way, to cut some deals that other people might not have. But one possibility is to remove that government and put in power a pro-Russian government. I don't see that as a viable end game because that government won't last for a week without Russian troops occupying the country. So it's like a prolonged babysitting exercise, uh, babysitting 44 million people who are not particularly happy to have you in their midst and who probably will wage some kind of resistance campaign. The second is to hive off the South, right? So all those areas I told you in the Black Sea coast make Ukraine landlocked to create, they've already done this, a land bridge from Russia direct to Crimea. So now there's only a bridge across the strait. And then to lop off some areas in the Northeast bits and pieces to keep the Donbass and then demand a peace from Ukraine in which they pledge that they will not enter NATO. Let me say that I think NATO has been utterly irresponsible in the way that it's treated Ukraine. In 2008, it said, we look forward to the day when Ukraine will become a member of NATO. Then the United States and Western European countries ratcheted up defense cooperation with Ukraine, including naval exercises, including retrofitting two American ports to accommodate Russian warships, right? So the Ukrainians were primed. If you went to Ukraine, joining NATO was like a religion. But the fact of the matter is that they had no intention of admitting Ukraine to NATO. So they put Ukraine in an impossible position. On the one hand, they kept saying, President Biden and Jens Stoltenberg, two days before the war, Ukraine has a right to join whatever alliance it wants, the door of NATO is open. So they pissed off the Russians, made the Russians determined to carry out this campaign, but didn't admit NATO into, uh, didn't admit Ukraine into NATO, which would have meant that it would have been covered by Article 5 the collective security agreement. So this is not a particularly uh, proud moment, I think, for the Western Alliance. They can do, there, there is talk of putting up a um, no-flight zone over Ukraine. That would be committing suicide. Think about an American uh, no-fly zone over the skies of Ukraine and a squadron of Russian fighter jets breaches it. Are you going to start shooting Russian 
planes out of the sky now would be the worst possible way to do something. You can ratchet up sanctions more, but the history of sanctions, and Jack maybe can talk more about this, my read of it is they work sometimes, they don't work other, other times. When do they not work? If the target state has decided that what it is doing is extremely important to it, we may not understand those reasons, it will suffer an enormous amount of pain. So states are not like accountants who look with spreadsheets. They fight for pride, status, glory, all sorts of things. So I don't think uh, uh, the sanctions will work fast enough to save Ukraine. I think the tide has turned. I don't think there'll be a quick Russian victory, but I think we're at an inflection point where the war is going in their direction. Bruce, I see you looking at your watch. I, I, I see your body language. I'm gone. You're actually uh, one of the better ones. Okay, so um, we'll take questions now. Um, there was one question uh, from the chat, but um, Professor Menon essentially answered that. So uh, who wants to uh, either make a comment or a question? Who wants to go first? Uh, yeah, in the back, go ahead, stand up. Just ask the question, it's okay. People, it, forget, it's, people forget my name all the time. Don't worry about it. Including his wife, but um, Rajan Menon is his name. You mentioned that in 2008 that Ukraine or NATO offered Ukraine a position on NATO, but I thought that since NATO's concession was missed, it was clear that Ukraine would not be a part of NATO. So I'm wondering if you could speak more about that. Sure. So I'm going to sit down. You can hear me, right? Okay. What? Use the mic? No, no, it's just uh, the people who are online ask if you could just oh, wait, summarize uh, the question very briefly. Uh, he said, tell me if I've got this right. He said in 2008, there was some uh, pledge made to include Ukraine in NATO, but it was really not a good faith pledge, if I've got you correctly. So what happened was this. Uh, it, at the Bucharest summit in 2008, NATO said, and I'm paraphrasing, Ukraine and Georgia will one day be in NATO and we look forward to that day, right? President Putin uh, was overheard by a Russian journalist on good authority saying that if Ukraine ever enters NATO, it will enter with a good part of its east missing and a good part of the Crimean Peninsula missing. I will break Ukraine poor, I will, uh, I will, I will allow it to enter uh, NATO. Two weeks before the NATO summit, uh, the American ambassador to Ukraine, William Burns, now the head of the CIA, wrote a cable to the State Department in which he said, across the spectrum of the political and national security establishment in Russia is deep opposition to NATO expansion, right? And that Ukraine status in particular is deeply troubling to them. Now you might say, and you know, this Jack makes a good point. Well, you know, they weren't gonna let them in and so on and so forth. Now put yourself in Vladimir Putin's position, right? From 1999, when the first tranche of members was admitted to NATO, NATO went from 16 members to now 30. No one would have predicted that. So for him to believe that at some point Ukraine might be in NATO is not utter fantasy. What I cannot explain to you is why he chose this moment to do it. I don't have any idea why he chose this moment to do it. But I think the debate over was it NATO, is it democracy, is like a cat chasing its tail. It never resolves itself, right? Complicated things are created by a concatenation of complicated events, and they all mesh together to create this. And I think a single factor explanation such as it's that or that. Uh, it may work out in an equation, but in real life, I don't think it works out very well. Okay, I'm gonna take a uh, question from the chat. It's directed at Professor Menon, but actually any of you could uh, answer this. What role do you see for Turkey in enforcing the terms of the Montreux Convention that governs passage through the Turkish Strait? So it was directed at Professor Menon, but well, if either I, of you- I, I've spoken enough, so let me- Somebody, uh, uh, well, <laughs> Jack, you want to? So Turkey has taken a position on this. They have told the Russians that they want to, the, the Montreux Convention of 1936 governs the passage of warships through the Turkish Straits. David knows this. 
And the Turks have said to the Russians that we don't, we want to regulate the flow. And, um, and the Russians have said, we will respect that. Turkey has an interesting role to play. So on, on Wednesday, I think it is, the foreign minister of Ukraine, Dimitro Kuleba, and the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, are meeting, guess where, in Turkey. Because the Russians, I think, be, believe that the United States, although it's very important, is too compromised in their eyes to serve as a mediator. And they've looked at variously Israel, which is very close to Russia. And although it voted for the UN General Assembly resolution, it has steadfastly not condemned the Russians. There are complicated reasons for that. Uh, Turkey and possibly China. So whether something happens in Turkey, I don't know. If the war winds down and that army I mentioned to you is encircled and destroyed, the Russians might put peace terms on the table. One thing that's being discussed is Ukraine has to say formally that Crimea is Russian territory. Very hard for Zelensky to do for reasons of Ukrainian politics that I can't get into. And to recognize the Donbas republics that it still claims as independent, but whereas they occupy only one third of Lugansk and Donetsk province, they, they claim all of it. And Putin has recognized that right. So this is a very bitter pill to swallow in Ukrainian politics. And I don't know if they can do it, but if, they, if the question is saving the country, will they bite the bullet and do it? I, I don't know. I have, okay. a, I have a quickie to add to that. In 1912, there was a war between uh, Turkey and uh, and uh, Libya, I guess. And um, in the course of that war, Turkey closed the Turkish Straits to commercial traffic through the Black Sea to the Mediterranean uh, for months and months. Uh, Russian, uh, Ukrainian uh, wheat production, which, you know, went all over the world and was crucial to the uh, economy of the Russian Empire, was bottled up. Um, one of the most powerful people in the Russian cabinet was the agriculture minister, Krivoshine, who then coalesced around him a kind of hawkish coalition that took the view, we need to seize militarily the Turkish Straits so that never again can we be blockaded in uh, this way. So uh, the Montreux Convention is now a little bit different than it was in 1912. So I'm not saying you can just Xerox a copy of that, uh, but just say it. OK, uh, there are a bunch of questions online, but I want to go to the audience uh, that's here. Uh, anybody want to? Um... Yeah, go ahead. Stand up, please. Uh, yeah. How long do you think the crisis is going to last? <laughs> Who is this for? Okay. I think the answers are all the same. Nobody knows. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, if anybody tells you that, that they know, reach for your wallet <laughs> and check if it's that. Nobody can tell you that. We don't know. Uh, one of the things I've learned about this is sometimes you think you know a lot about a subject and you have to have the humility to understand that you could really be wrong about some central things. So this has been a kind of chastening experience for me personally. So I cannot tell you when it will end. I will tell you that I think the resistance of the Ukrainian army and especially the morale of people who are lying down in front of tanks has been extraordinary. Even allowing for the fact that the Russians didn't want to run off and seize big cities right away. The resistance has been, uh, I would say remarkable, uh, praiseworthy, uh, indeed heroic. Okay, there are a bunch. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I think it's going to last long enough so that the world will be faced with an inconclusive struggle where uh, the Russian military is exacting uh, uh, illegal and horrifying pain on Ukrainian citizens for uh, months. Um, that Russia will not be able to, in any speedy way, occupy all of Ukraine, nor will Russia give up. Um, and therefore, 
even though Raj is right that the no-fly zone enforced by you know NATO aircraft over central Ukraine is just not going to happen, thank God. Uh, there will be, I think, an increasing question of whether you know violations of the laws of war, crimes against humanity, uh, can be allowed to happen on a massive scale where the wealthy, powerful NATO countries just kind of sit there behind the fence and look at that happen from Poland or whether they will ratchet up military assistance, uh, not just MiG-29s, but everything we can throw into the war so that the Ukrainians can defend themselves. That's going to be a huge issue that's moral, political, strategic, economic. And um, so it'll last long enough for that issue to be on our front page for months. Cynthia, I think you had a response. Yeah, I would just add to that, um, the Russian, Putin will not back down. He'll increase repression in Russia before that happens. Um, it's unlikely that he'll be removed. Um, having surrounded himself, but we can't predict that. We don't know. We would want to look for cracks in the security forces, but we're unlikely to see them before they would emerge anyway. Um, and so I agree. It's a long war by comparison to short wars. It may not be longer than months because the brutality will increase the pressure and shame on the West, which cannot engage in direct military confrontation with Russia, but the pressure will grow. This is something I've also predicted. And that's why I'm worried about the nuclear risks because um, Putin has already stated that um, there are a number of red lines. Uh, some of this is perhaps nuclear signaling. One of the reasons for nuclear signaling is to deter enlargement of the war to have the West come in and change the balance of power. Um, but here's, here's the rub, right? The pressure is going to be to grow because sanctions are not going to do their job in time. This was also predictable. Um, and uh, we, um, I, I agree completely and have written that it was a complete strategic blunder to leave Ukraine in limbo. Yes, many thought it was no way Ukraine was going to be joining NATO anytime soon, um, but then we should have uh, taken it off the table. To leave Ukraine in limbo on the NATO question was to tempt Russia to increase its power and act. Um, and at the same time, one additional factor where I slightly disagree with Jack, I, I don't think, uh, I agree with, you know, all of us agree that you can't reduce this to one element um, it isn't, I disagree with the Mearsheimer argument in this respect, but it's also worth looking at how the U.S. has been increasing bilateral military arrangements with um, uh, Eastern flank countries, uh, Poland in particular, but also Ukraine. And the Russians have been citing this for a long time. In track two discussions before the war started, there were um, attempts to increase stability and address Russia's security concerns about the potential stationing of missiles um, in, in, um, um, in Eastern Europe um, as, a, uh, as a way of redressing, in fact, Russia's major military buildup. Um, but uh, so the Russians do have and did have legitimate security concerns, but unfortunately they've fallen back into the trap uh, of uh, acting aggressively to address their security concerns in a way that's gonna leave them much worse off. Um, can I add a really quick word? I, I agree with Cynthia completely. Um, I just wanna add the following, that it's important not to reduce this NATO expansion alone, but it's also important not to just dismiss it. Think of it this way. Imagine that the Cold War had ended with the collapse of NATO and the Warsaw Pact, NATO's equivalent, had been alive and well, and the Soviet Union was alive and well. And the Warsaw Pact began to move into this hemisphere and take in Honduras, Guatemala, Mexico, and said to us all along, the Cold War is over. You don't have to worry. These are all peaceful expansions. 
Look at the history of this country and tell me, would anybody here have thought of that as a benign act? The idea of moving a Cold War alliance toward Russia's border, starting in the 1990s, when its GDP had collapsed by 30%, when it was being hailed as a democracy, and pushing it further and further, risked the possibility that there would be a day of reckoning when you'd have a stronger Russia that would be able to push back. Now, do I justify what the Russians have done? It is a war of aggression and a preventive war. And despite my criticisms of NATO expansion, I don't justify it in any way. But we've gotten to a place in this country where if you try to explain the Russian reasoning, you've got to hold up a sign and say, I am not an apologist for Putin. There's kind of a Latter-day McCarthyism that's kind of set in here where you have to establish your bona fides. And you know, I just don't uh, want to play this game. So I think it is not correct to say that Russian security concerns are irrelevant to this. It was known from, de we know from declassified documents that I was looking at just as recently as yesterday, that there were cables upon cables upon cables well before Putin came. President Yeltsin on a number of occasions said, why, given that the Cold War has ended, Bill, he said to Clinton, are you expanding NATO and creating a new division? Can we join NATO? He asked. At one point, Putin proposed that Russia enjoy, uh, uh, join NATO. So if you create a security structure and have a powerful country like Russia on the outside, that is not a smart thing to do because countries rise and fall in power over time. So we're dealing with a different kind of Russia. We're also dealing, unfortunately, with a repressive and vicious uh, leadership that has shown by the nature of the wars waging in Ukraine that it is prepared to inflict huge pain to win. On Jack's question about shipping missiles and so on, I think he's right, that will probably happen. The problem will be, will Ukraine have an army left? Because if the main force is encircled, right, and forced to surrender, then you reduce training guerrillas and so on and urban resistors. The problem there is you face is if they begin to fail, the West has two choices. One to say, well, we tried really hard, uh, sorry guys, or to start ratcheting up the involvement. There are people in Washington who would push for the latter. It's a dangerous game because you're playing 5,000 miles away from the United States and right next to the Russian border not a good place to have a face-off with, with, uh, uh, with, you, uh, with Russia, it seems to me. Okay, there are um, several questions online that are essentially asking the same thing, so I'll kind of uh, extrapolate those. And it has to do with um, Putin's hold on power, um, that if uh, things begin to um, deteriorate, the Russian army starts to lose um, soldiers, that the uh, sanctions start really harming ordinary people, um, what is the possibility that Putin will be replaced by uh, the military and others in the Kremlin? Uh, whoever wants to answer. So uh, I think we all have uh, want to jump in on this. Uh, Russia has no history of military coups. Um, um, there was a case with Khrushchev's removal. Uh, the military participated but didn't instigate uh, his removal. Um, it's possible, but not likely. Things would have to get very bad. And we have, again, a different information uh, look at what's happening on the ground than Russians do right now. Um, and if uh, the Ukrainian army is defeated and they go into insurgency, uh, then this would be unlikely. Uh, if the Russians suffer major losses and the trend line is adverse to them, that might be then the question, because then you have economic uh, pain uh, in addition to uh, potential military failure. But that does not, to me, look like the likely outcome. Uh, yes, exactly what uh, Cynthia said. Uh, n military, no history of meddling in politics. Uh, the oligarchs are the creatures of Putin that have no independent power base. And uh, Russian civil society uh, is weak, disorganized, and chronically inert. Uh, 
So I think it would take an unbelievable disaster of outrageous proportions to topple Putin as a result of this war. I just wanted uh, to mention uh, one of my favorite political science books. Uh, it's entitled War and Punishment by Hein Gomans. And uh, it's, it's about uh, war termination. And when do states terminate wars that are not going well in a timely fashion? And one of his arguments is that democracies are pretty good at cutting their losses uh, before blundering into self-destructive escalation of really egregious proportions. Because people running democracies who blunder into losing wars know that pretty much the worst that's going to happen to them is they'll get voted out of office, not strung up. Um, with authoritarians, and this is based on you know, data from the last two centuries. This is very systematic research. Uh, uh, Gomans says that with authoritarians, um, it depends uh, on one thing, is whether the authoritarian leader believes that he has the capacity to repress opposition reliably. And in, if so, he can afford to lose a war, a smallish, even maybe medium-sized war uh, without losing his office or his head. Um, and uh, so if you think Putin is good at repressing domestic dissent, um, you might think that he would feel confident in actually uh, saying, you know what, this isn't going well, I'm gonna cut a deal and get out of this. Uh, however, Gomans shows that for uh, weaker authoritarian leaders who are accountable to some kind of um, elite cartel interest group that may actually have the power to depose him uh, and then execute him, which is what very often happens to these weaker uh, dictators who lose wars. They tend, says Gomans, to gamble for resurrection. If the war's going badly, they double down and say, I can't afford to lose even a small war, so therefore I need to make it a big war so that they don't kick me out of power. Because I, you know, I'm I'm at risk of losing my head from losing a small war equally as a big war. A couple of quick words on this. Oh, um, okay. Why don't we go to another question? Oh, Unless, okay. uh, something it, really. It'll be very. It'll be very quick. Okay. Um, I watch Russian television, and if you do, you get a completely sanitized view of this war. You have no idea of what is going on. Publications and media platforms cannot use the word invasion or attack or war or war, anything like that. So the Russian people don't know. There have been petitions, there have been some demonstrations, but nothing that the regime cannot, uh, cannot handle. One of the things that worries me about the debate going on in this country is there are people now saying, this is an opportunity for regime change in Russia. And let me tell you why I think this is a really dangerous idea. One possibility is you'll get another Putin, but everybody in the Russian national security establishment is committed to this war and committed to Putin's view of NATO. The second, the hope is you'll get you know, we can never get this out of our system, right? You'll get a democracy, right? Now, you'd better be damn sure that a third possibility doesn't happen, which is outright chaos and violence in the only other nuclear superpower in the world. And that would be completely crazy. So when I hear people trying to talk about, yet again, taking a little democratic uh, toolkit and experimenting on one other country, or using this as an occasion, have Ukrainians die so there can be a democracy in Russia because they think that's a possibility. Sitting in a think tank in Washington, D.C. and doing that is about as close to an obscenity as I can think of. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to come back to the question. Of How are you? <laughs> I owe you an email. I'll get back. <laughs>
seems to me that Mr. Cruz is a bit of a leading figure of negotiations of the sanctions. I mean, you know, as it relates to the sanctions, and on the other hand, it doesn't really seem clear what's the threshold where you think that the sanctions are working yeah. and what's the objective, considering that collateral liberation is not just right. forced. Yeah, yeah. And so from there, where do you go? Right. Uh, Yeah. Okay, so for those online, it was a question about the utility of sanctions. Uh, that's a very good question. So if you're using sanctions to punish somebody for what they've done, right, and you just keep doing it, it's one thing. But if you want to terminate a war, you have to indicate what are the conditions that have to be met for sanctions to be eased and ultimately lifted. So without that, Right? It's going to seem, it seems to me very hard if Putin eventually gets militarily the upper hand for him to go to the table while all sanctions are in their place as they are. Unless he's told, well, there are certain benchmarks that have to be met for this, that, and the other uh, to happen. As for mediations, you know, there's a school of thought here that I kind of used to belong to, which said, Putin is a great power man, and he only thinks there's only one other country that's worth talking to. It's the United States. The Europeans don't matter. They're lap dogs. Uh, nobody else much matters. Turkey doesn't matter. Israel doesn't matter. I think the relationship now between the US and Russia is so poisonous that I'm not sure that we have a role to play in mediation. So you might see something like the Turks or the Chinese. I have no idea, and I could be wrong. I'm just speculating. So that's my best guess. Okay, uh, the, um, there's a question online, a couple that refer to the uh, February 21st speech from uh, Putin where he uh, justified the invasion as part of Russia's need to rectify the past and restore Ukraine's rightful place as part of greater Russia. Uh, somebody wanna, I mean, Jack, I know you've talked on this before. Yeah, I, I, I have. Uh, Talking to the mic. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't think that the um, fantastical utterances of Putin about the Russian nation make any sense once we've seen how his army has behaved yeah. in Ukraine. I think it's just complete baloney. Whether it's baloney that Putin in a twisted way believes, I'm not sure. We should state clearly, there are no Nazis to denazify in Ukraine, and the president of Ukraine is Jewish. So this is an appalling mistake on that level as well. Yeah, the Nazi thing is absolutely Well, it's absurd. not a mistake, it's disinformation. It's, yes, it's, I it's mean, an out-and-out out lie. It's, 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 an out, it's an outrageous and, and when lie. you hear serious Russian officials standing before the camera and saying this, I mean, it just beggars belief. It's absolutely ludicrous, and you should pay it no heat at all and treated as complete propaganda. Okay, do we have other questions where, uh, how much time do we have? Uh, so one more usually means two more. Go ahead. <laughs> My question is, okay. do you mind re removing? Yeah. yeah, okay. My question is purely hypothetical and possibly even unnecessary, but what it means with conflict if uh, Putin just drops dead tomorrow? How would it persist, how would it end, how would, who would step up? Boy, you're really lining us up against the wall here. <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. <laughs> There's a good political science book by Sarah Krako that shows yeah. that one of uh, the key factors in war termination, especially wars that were started by somebody and then didn't go very well, is whether that person is succeeded in power by some uh, new figure who is not implicated in the decision to start the war in the first place. So this is actually one, you know, for just statistical analysis of war termination, that's a biggie. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. We could stay here for much longer, um, but we uh, did say we wanted to end at a quarter of it, so we, uh, we're doing that. So uh, we'll have more of these kinds of events. Thank you to the panel.
Thank you to, uh, to Dean Rich and the uh, Cohen Powell School for uh, sponsoring this.